here today with you. Thank you, Yifat, for the opportunity to be here. And thank you all for joining today. Maybe we could um, just start, if it's OK with you, with uh, if you could just introduce yourself and, and say, uh, if, if you're willing to, the recording is on, uh, if you could just say your name and uh, where you're located and, and where you're teaching or on uh, administration. Okay, I guess I'll start. My name is Nahami Silberberg. Um, I live in London, Ontario, Canada, and I'm a grade five, six, seven Judaic teacher, as well as the Judaic principal here in the school. It's a local uh, Hebrew day school, very small in numbers, but mighty. <laughs> I guess I have the Hanukkah spirits. So anyway, I'm really looking forward to today's um, presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Alexandra? Hi, I'm Alexandra. I'm located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I uh, teach Judaics in grade five and then nine to 12. And I also um, coordinate the Hagim programming in high school. So I put on all the holiday celebrations. Great, thank you. Uh, Hi, David Azarad. First, I just wanted to help you see me because I think my the thing fell and the camera seems like, I mean, I'm looking at myself, it's like huge uh, screen there, but I don't know, something's wrong with the camera, but whatever, you can see me, it's fine. Uh, I am David Azard, located in uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, uh, Herzliya High School, Director of Judaic Studies. Great, thank you. Uh, Riva? So I don't know if Riva Hamburger, I'll speak for both Riva and Tova. I don't know if they can speak right now because they are just traveling to, I mean, because they're the exams, so they're, they might be able to speak soon as they're driving, I think. But Riva Hamburger and Tova has been both teachers uh, at the Herzli High School. Okay, great, thank you. Well, it's great to, to join with you and I understand some other people will be joining perhaps based on the recording. So as Yifat mentioned, I uh, founded and direct the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development and Jewish Eco Seminars. And I am here in Jerusalem. I'm gonna actually do a screen share uh, with a presentation. I understand we have a little less than two hours together. So I'm going to, for the first hour or so, share with you a, a presentation on, on teaching on Judaism and ecology. Uh, then I think we can take a five minute break. Uh, and then I'd like to come back and to share with you some curriculum resources that exist uh, that are free for teaching on Judaism and ecology. So I'm gonna start with a screen share and uh, this should also make it a little bit more interesting for you. So, Nechami raised her hand. I just, um, is there a grade that this is geared to, or is this just this, like? This is, this is grade geared for K through 12. It's, if someone's teaching in kindergarten, then they'd obviously have to adapt this. Uh, but the resources that we have developed and that from other organizations that I'm gonna share with you, um, can be adapted to, to all age levels. So briefly, I live in Jerusalem with my wife, Shana, and our two children, Halal and Shekharia. I grew up in California, went to uh, uh, Temple Isaiah and Camp Tawanga near Yosemite, a Jewish summer camp. And uh, then I came to Israel. Um, I have 150 relatives in Toronto and I taught at URJ Camp George before the pandemic. I've lived here in Jerusalem for 18 years and uh, received uh, Orthodox Smicha here, ordination here in, in Israel and, um, and direct uh, the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development as well as the, the uh, Jewish Ego Summoners branch. I published a book called Eco Bible, which is an ecological commentary on the Torah. We would have titled it Eco Torah, but we also wanted 
Christians who number 2.2 billion to buy it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's written, uh, co-authored by me and Rabbi Leo D. Uh, as you're likely aware in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, God placed the human being in the Garden of Eden to serve it and conserve it. And in this two-volume commentary, we have 400 commentaries on 400 different verses, which is based on, on Jewish teaching over the millennia. Now, we actually just published volume two last week, and uh, both volume one and volume two are available on Amazon and on Kindle and as paperback, as well as um, available by order from bookstores. And it's been a number one bestseller on Amazon in multiple categories. So as I said, for the first hour of our time together, I'd like to share with you 18 Jewish teachings on ecological sustainability. These are a set of resources that I developed a number of years ago. Uh, and, and, these re and so what I'm going to go through these 18 topics um, but my doing so is really, I'm just going to spend about three minutes on each topic by way of introduction. A, a lot of them you're familiar with, but, uh, but in my doing so, I, I want to make clear that for each of these 18 topics, there exists a short article, a longer article, and a study guide or a source sheet with Hebrew English sources, an audio teaching, and a short video. So for each of these teachings, we've developed a range of materials to help educators teach on these topics. And the materials were developed by Confein Sharim, a, a Jewish environmental organization that's now part of Grow Torah, based in New Jersey, uh, in partnership with Jewcology. So <clears throat> I also want to, as a sort of a word of introduction, state something that, that many of you are, are probably familiar with, that many young Jews today care more about ecology than they do about Torah or about Jewish learning. Many young Jews are acutely aware of and concerned about the ecological crisis. And some of these young Jews participate in Fridays for the Future weekly climate market protests. And because of this reality that that young Jews are growing up with so much ecological concern. Jewish education should speak to this core concern or else it's gonna fall flat for many young Jews. If you know, we, can, we can talk as, until we're blue in the face about uh, many Jewish topics, but for, for young Jews who, who, who sense acutely the ecological crisis, this is, it's very important that Jewish education relate to it. So the first of these 18 teachings that I want to share with you is it's on the Torah portion of Genesis, Bereshit. And uh, this is in the, in the first teaching that we have, it's actually a rabbi, Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zichrona Livracha, is the one who wrote the teaching. Um, and it's actually based on a book, a book of his, uh, Dignity of Difference, um, and according to, to this understanding of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where it says, uh, uh, that we should be fruitful and multiply um, and conquer the earth, and, and rule over the fish of the sea, etc. So we're entitled to this domination and preeminence only as long as, as we cultivate our godlike qualities. Because the verse also says that God created us in the image of God. And so in the Talmud and the Midrash, it says that only when we act in the image of God are we given preeminence and, and dominion. But if we uh, don't act in that way, then we are ruled by animals. We're taken down. And, and so we can see that today of how our virus, which spreads a zoonotic disease that likely spread from, from bats to an intermediate species to people is now in a sense ruling over people. It's, it's changed the entire human life and economy over the past two years. So what does it mean to rule? Rabbi, Chief Rabbi uh, Abraham Isaac Harkon Cook says that it's not the dominion of a harsh ruler. It couldn't have been the vision of God for us to rule like a tyrant over the earth, but rather 
it's it's tied to the aspect of being fruitful. It says pru or vu umilu et aret. So we're supposed to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with kiv shuha, and to conquer it. It's only in the sense of preserving life's diversity and helping life perpetuate itself. This is a teaching that one of my rabbis, Rabbi Daniel Cohen, taught, and assuming moral responsibility. And 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 the verse the, in the first chapter of Genesis is moderated by the verse in the second chapter of Genesis of where God said to work it and protect it by an began Eden Shomra to work it and conserve it as Rabbi Sachs translated translates it. But modern society is not necessarily conserving. We are degrading nature in in very significant ways. Uh, and so that the domination can also be understood by a similar word in Pirkei Avot, Ezehu Gibor, who is the strong person, Hakovesh Etzro, the person who conquers their in inclination, their negative inclination. So the word Kivshuha, to conquer, is used in a sense of, of our inner self. So that's teaching number one about, about Genesis. And you're probably familiar with this. Hopefully, as I go on, this will we'll get into some new territory. The second teaching is about Noah and an ethic of sustainability. There's a midrash that said that Noah planted, watered, and cut down trees to make the ark for 120 years before the flood. God, God warned Noah 120 years before the flood. In our times, a, a Swedish climate scientist uh, came up with a theory of climate change 120 years ago in 1896. The Swedish chemist Arrhenius was awarded the Nobel Prize for the theory of climate change. And so we've actually known about this issue for 120 years. And it's just now that um, British Columbia, for example, is experiencing significant flooding. Taking responsibility on the ark. The Torah says that God made the, uh, God told Noah to make the ark of three levels. And the Midrash says that one level was for people, the bottom level, the middle level was for animals, the bottom level was for animal waste and people's waste. And the question is, why didn't Noah just throw it overboard? So one possibility is because Noah and his family saved the waste in order to use it as fertilizer when they got off the ark. One of the first things Noah did was plant a vineyard, and a lot of the topsoil may have been washed away when Noah, uh, after the flood. Also, the rainbow has significant ecological significance. Uh, according to the Ramban, the rainbow is an upside down bow, and uh, in war, in ancient times, when they used bows and arrows, the, the side that wanted to surrender would put the bow in the air, and that would indicate that they wanted to stop fighting. And so, according to Rabbi Shlomo Riskin and Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, one of the Racha, ancient societies would would put the bow upside down, and and but there's to to make to say that they wanted peace, and so God is also saying that that's the Ramban. In our times, we have uh, uh, implicit responsibility to also make peace and not to make war on the earth. And that's the other half of the rainbow. And, and so the rainbow testifies to the creator's intention for life on our planet to continue to exist. But we need to maintain that as well. Some, some religious people say we don't need to worry about ecology because God will just take care of it. Maybe they're right. But if they're wrong, then then our children and grandchildren will play, pay a very serious price for our failure to take responsibility. And, and according to, to Rabbi Risk and Rabbi Sachs, we, we, there's an implicit second half of the rainbow that we need to take responsibility ourselves. Uh, the third teaching, sorry, I should say teaching number three at the top is about Shemitah, the, which is the sabbatical year that we're in this year. But the land should rest. It's one of the mitzvot of the Torah. Uh, conserving the soil through fallow years is, is something that the Rambam Maimonides talked about. And Menachem Fruman said the connection between people and land is the connection to our life source. Uh, the, the, the sabbatical year is about ownership and release, that we, we, we farm the land every six years and we release it in the seventh year. And, 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 and the produce grown in the land of Israel this year uh, if it's grown in accordance with the, the Shemitah principles, it has Kedusha Shvi'it, the, the sanctification, the, the holiness of the seventh year. And that guides us to an awareness that everything is created by God. Now, the question is, how do, what does Shemitah mean this year? Because for most Jews, we're not farmers. There's very few Jews that are farmers. 
and and so therefore we need to think about beyond you know how how we consume produce this year to think about how do we, how does the sabbatical year impact our lives and how can we apply it to slow down um, just like there's six days that we work and one day that we rest so too the vision of the Torah is six years that we work and one year that we rest and and also that we let the land rest and so that's that's sort of a meta shemitah question. Um, and we see in our society today, a, a society that doesn't rest and de with deforestation, soil loss in Canada, the, the tar sands exploitation in Alberta, Canada is now the fourth largest oil exporter in the world. And, and tar sands is, is made of, it comes from, uh, has bitumen in it, which is a, a, a fossil fuel that's extracted through a chemical process um, it's interesting because in, in, in Genesis, it says that the kings of Sodom fell into bitumen, be'erot, be'erot, chemar. And the word chemar is understand as, as a fossil fuel, a naturally occurring fossil fuel on the surface of the land that, that was in the Dead Sea. And, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, these evil kings were stuck in the fossil fuels. And according to the Midrash, Avraham came and pulled them out of the fossil fuels. It took the prophet of light to take them out of the fossil fuels. So, so too in our times, humanity is stuck in the fossil fuels and we need some spiritual inspiration to help pull us out the, of, of them. The fourth teaching of the 18 that, that we have resources on is, is Yishuv Eretz Yisrael, sustain, sustainability in settling the land of Israel. In the time of the Mishnah, the rabbis banned raising small grazing animals in the land of Israel, sheep and goats because they saw how they were devastating the crops. And our ancestors made short-term sacrifices in order to preserve their resources, actions we should emulate to help us find ways for today's ecological reality. In other words, the rabbis understood that in order to have Yeshuv Eretz Yisrael, sustainability in the settling of the land, there had to be some changes that they made or else the, the sheep and goats, these voracious consumers of vegetation would run rampant on the land. And, the rabbis also for, forbid the cutting of grapevines and olive trees for use as firewood in the temple of Jerusalem. And so today we would call this an ethic of sustainability. They saw that here's a picture of a thousand year old olive tree near Jerusalem. And they saw that it was, it was crazy to cut down old growth trees for firewood. Uh, but today we cut down old growth trees for Amazon packaging and toilet paper. So, so we have much to learn from, from the rabbis uh, who, who really, even though, you know, it, the word environmentalist or, or, or having concern for sustainability is a modern concept, but what I'm trying to show here, what I've shown in, in the books that I've, I've written is that this is actually an ancient concept. So another example of Yeshu versus Israel is, is Migrash, this aspect of open spaces around the cities of the land of Israel. It's another one of the 613 commandments, the Tariag Mitzvot, that relate to ecology. And this is, this is one the Torah says it should apply to the 48 Levite cities, but the Talmud in Masechet Arachin says it should actually apply to all Israelite cities. So, you know, today Toronto is a, is a major metropolis, as is Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Uh, but in ancient times, if, if a town got too big, it, it wasn't able to expand beyond the green belt around the town. It had to, they had to make a, a new town in a different location. They couldn't just keep expanding and expanding. In our times, the uh, greater Bay Area in China that includes Hong Kong and Macau has 70 million people in it in one contiguous air, urban area. And in the, in the next 10 or 20 years is projected to have 100 million people in one contiguous urban area. So according to the Torah, there, there shouldn't be such a thing. The next teaching is about Shabbat. And the prophet Isaiah said, if you call the, the Shabbat a delight, an oneg, and you honor it by, doing your, by not doing your habituated ways, by not pursuing your affairs and speaking words, then you shall delight with God. So there's this aspect of oneg that we often associate with, with eating food in a kiddish, um, but oneg is also a spiritual concept of, of uh, being close to God. Um, in our times, Shabbat is more needed than ever. 
we live much faster paced lives than our ancestors lived. We drive in cars and on airplanes and use technology where we're able to access so much information uh, and, and we scroll through people's lives on the, the scroll of Facebook. Um, and so Shabbat is even more important today to, you know, to, to ideally turn off our cell phones and to disconnect from Facebook uh, on Shabbat. We are human beings and not human doings, and Shabbat reinforces that. This is a picture in Tel Aviv on Yom Kippur uh, of where the, this, the, this major urban area of 2 million people essentially shuts down and the air pollution falls dramatically. Yom Kippur is called Shabbat Shabbaton. And the Pia Sessna Rebbe, Rabbi Kalanamitz Kalman Shapira, teaches that spiritual pleasure is the answer to the draw toward physical pleasures. So, so Shabbat is actually a deep ecological principle because it can help us to connect to family and community and God instead of seeking the source of our pleasure just in consumer society and, and physicality. Teaching number six, Baal Tashrit, summoning the will not to waste. It's based on verses in the book of Deuteronomy. Ki ha'adam etz ha'sadeh lavo mi panecha b'amatzor is the tree of the field, a person to go into the siege before you. And from this principle about not cutting fruit trees in war for a siege, we learn a much general principle. The, the Rishonim, the Jewish commentators between 1000 and 1500 CE conclude that Jewish law forbids wasting any, any resources of benefit to people. We're not supposed to waste things. And yet, uh, and, and we live in a very wasteful society today. Baal Tashrit applies to dress, energy, water, money, and every usable resource. And the throwing out of edible food is also, that's like according to Rabbi Yishmael, and it's accepted by, by most of the, the post game, the rabbinic arbiters today. Throwing out edible food is, is a Torah prohibition. Yet in modern society, one third of food is wasted, including in many, many Jewish events. And so, that's something for us to think about. How do we how do we live the values of Baal Tashrit amidst a society of abundance? The seventh teaching in this series of teachings on Jewish ecology is holy use relating to resources sustainably. There's a teaching about Jacob in Parsha Vayishlach, Vayivater Yaakov Levado Vayeavek Ish Imo Ad Alot Shachar, and Jacob was left alone. And, 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 a, and a man wrestled with him until the dawn. In that moment, the, the rabbis of the Talmud say that Jacob went back for small vessels. And uh, according to some of the Hasidic understandings, he went back because he realized that his, he had to raise up the physical sparks and that his soul was connected to those vessels. Pharaoh, in last week's Torah portion, told in, in Parshat uh, Vayigash, told Yosef, to tell his family to leave their vessels behind. Don't worry about them. In Egypt, we have a lot. But, but actually, uh, the verse says that he took, that, that Yaakov took what he had with him. And, and again, the waste in modern society is, is tremendous. Reuse as an elevation of the holy sparks contained in each physical object that we acquire. This is a Hasidic understanding based on, on Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlav. And in the Talmud, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai on his deathbed told his students to remove the vessels from his room, lest they become contaminated and need to be destroyed. And so that shows the concern that one of the great Jewish teachers of 2000 years ago had for not wasting these earthenware vessels as he was dying. That's probably the last thing that he said to his students, be concerned for the vessels. Also on Sukkot, we can elevate waste by using agricultural refuse as, as the cover, the schach for the sukkah. That was, that's also a teaching from the Talmud. And, and we see the reuse of ritual objects in many times in Jewish teaching in, in the way that Korach's fire pans were reused and making eruv bread, reusing that for Shabbat bread and, and using the myrtle uh, from, hav, from the lulav for havdalah. Those are just a few examples. Teaching number eight, the spiritual roots of the ecological crisis. 
And again, each of these teachings has a whole set of resources on it that you can make use of. The ecological crisis is not only a crisis of the birds and the bees, the trees and the toads, it's fundamentally a spiritual crisis and it has spiritual roots and solutions. And some of those spiritual solutions are addressing the problem with Jewish values of taking responsibility, being satisfied, focusing on the present, and being conscious of the future. In Pirkei Avot, the, the Jewish sages teach that desire is one of the three traits that remove a person from the world. And desire also relates to instant self-gratification. And, and a lot of consumer society is, is driven by desire, tapping into to this desire for physical things. And that's the deeper root of, of ecological degradation is our, our over-consuming by, by our seeking physical gratification in the here and now. The, the sages also say in Pirkei Avet, Pirkei Avot, Ezehu Ashir HaSamech Bechelko, the person who's happy with their lot is the rich person, not, not you know, the person with $280 billion, which is how much the, the richest person in the world today has. And Time, Time Magazine yesterday awarded that person uh, the man of the year, person of the year, uh, which, which sort of shows the values of, of contemporary society. What if the person of the year was one of you for your excellence in Jewish education? That would be a... <laughs> Uh, perhaps a more fitting person of the year. Uh, okay, now that in terms of the spiritual roots being present in the moment, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid, as, as David Amelech, King David said in Psalms, and another spiritual root is long term thinking instead of short term thinking. Ezehu Chacham, who is the wise person, Haro'e Tanulad, the person who sees the consequences of their action, as the Ram Rambam interprets that a teaching of the Mishnah, the person who can see the long-term effects of their actions. If we can see what exploiting the tar sands of Alberta will do to earth, we wouldn't do it. If we could see what exploiting the, the huge gas reserves off the coast of Israel would do, we wouldn't do it, but, but we have trouble seeing. If we could see what eating 30 donuts during Hanukkah would do to our bodies, we wouldn't do it. Okay, what, what, so, so it's about connecting our long-term thinking um, and at the same time realizing, as before I eat this donut, how am I going to feel afterward? Donuts are one of the few foods that, that if I eat it, I immediately feel bad afterward. It's not that I feel guilty. It's that my body feels oily and, and fried. Teaching number nine, passing the test of wealth. Rabbi Nachman Abretz, Rabbi Natan Abretzlev teaches that Egypt was the heart of materialism. I, sh I should have put the Canadian dollar on this picture. He'll excuse me for the US centric slideshow. God charged the Israelites with the task of uplifting the wealth they took from Egypt through holy use, that, according to Likute Halachot of Rabbi Natan. And we are, there's also one of the 10th the of the Ten Commandments, the capstone of the Ten Commandments is do not covet lo tachmod. And don't be jealous of what others in our community have. I, I've, as I mentioned, I have a lot of relatives in Toronto. And, and so I've been to Toronto many times in my life, including two and a half years ago. And I'm aware that there's a lot of affluence in the, in the Toronto Jewish community, in the Montreal Jewish community. I was also uh, in Montreal uh, speaking at a synagogue a few years ago in the Vancouver Jewish community, in Calgary, Alberta. And... And the question is, how do we as a Jewish community relate to wealth and to materialism, which is the dominant force in, in the world today? The, the, the Jewish sages say that Korach was driven by material desire, and that's really what led him to his rebellion against Mos Moshe, Moses. And overconsumption is also a huge source of environmental degradation. There was a study that came out yesterday that, that said that, that uh, Amazon packaging is like up by 33% over a year ago. Not, it's not that they're, the Amazon packages more, it's just that people are buying more and more boxes and, and essentially everything that we consume today comes in multiple layers of packaging. Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlov said that donating to people in need can help to break the materialist mindset. 
maybe I'll just pause here since we've gone through nine topics. So we're now at the half halfway point. Are there any comments or questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if, if anything's coming up for you. I have a question. Would we maybe would we be able to access this? Um, will you be able to access this PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, I can make it available. Um, and and also, um, if you go to jewishecoseminars.com backslash learning, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll, I'll share it in the Zoom chat, the link. Um, these, there's much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving three slides and, you know, two to three minutes on each of these 18 topics. Um, but I, I, I worked with Confine Sharim a number of years ago to develop a set of materials on each of these 18 topics. So, so those are available as, yep. as long and short, short articles, yep. source sheets, yep. speakers notes, and um, video and audio. Um, and, and during the second hour that we're together, I'm gonna share some, some curricula that, that are available um, for different ages on Judaism and ecology. Yeah, Other, thank you. You're welcome. Are there comments or questions at this point? Okay, so then I'm gonna keep going. And if, if something does come up for you, even during my presentation, you're welcome to, to, to chime in. So I'm gonna start the share again. Okay. So teaching number 10 is about water, appreciating a limited resource that, as you know, the B'nai Israel were in the desert for 40 years. The prophet Jeremiah describes God as the source of living waters. And the, the whole question of water, it's interesting because uh, the prime minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, was just in the United Arab Emirates yesterday. Uh, and the UAE, Israel, and Jordan signed an agreement a couple of weeks ago to uh, share desalinated water from Israel for solar energy that will be produced in Jordan and built by an Emirati solar energy company. So water in the Middle East is, is something that is, is scarce. Um, Egypt outside of the Nile is actually uh, very scarce. Egypt is mostly desert and Israel is mostly desert. Most of the land of, of the modern state of Israel is desert in the Negev desert, in the Judean desert. I actually was um, in, a, in a neighborhood outside of Jerusalem today and I could see the Judean desert from the outskirts of Jerusalem and I could even see into Jordan, which is this, uh, the second most water scarce country in the world. Uh, so appreciating water through prayers and blessings. We, we pray for rain, as you know, that's part of Jewish prayer. We bless on water. That's probably the most common blessing that we make because we drink water more than we eat bread or more than we eat other things. Now, you're in Canada, which is the most, uh, aside from Russia, uh, which is the largest country in the world, Russia and Canada are the most water abundant countries in the world. So, and when I was at URJ Camp George, I saw in Northern Ontario, the, the lakes and the, the tremendous water abundance that you have. Uh, the, the recent flooding in British Columbia um, is, is sort of a wake up call that water, if, if, you know, if we don't curb climate change, that water will essentially turns against us. The, the city of Vancouver was cut off uh, from by all of its highways, all of the highways flooded and, and the city was cut off for a period during the record flooding that they just had when what they call an atmospheric river uh, came from the Pacific Ocean and essentially sort of like a fire hose uh, just dumped water on, on British Columbia in ways that they've never seen before. So, um, but, but Canada as a water abundant country might make it a little bit more difficult to connect to this teaching 
Um, but here in Israel, uh, the, the scarcity of water is, is very acute. And most of Israel's water now that's used for household consumption and is, is desalinated. So they burn gas in order to desalinate water through reverse osmosis. And, and so that's essentially a water crisis. That's part of why Syria had a civil war because there was the worst drought in 900 years. And so part of Jewish teaching and Jewish spiritual practice is developing a deeper awareness for water, not wasting it. There's all tashchit of water uh, and, and appreciating God for the water that God gives us. The 11th teaching is prayer, praying for a sustainable world. The power of praying for a shift to care and concern for God's creation. I'd be interested to hear how many of you in your schools have over the past year had in, in your class or in your school a prayer for sustainability, a prayer to curb climate change, a prayer for, for God's earth. Maybe you could just either say yes or put the little hand button on. I'm seeing a couple of no's. Um, you know, it's an amazing thing. And as, as I said earlier, for those, Jew, for those young people in your school who care deeply about this issue, to pray for God's creation would be a, an amazing point of Jewish engagement. You know, this isn't, this isn't idol worship. You know, some, some people, um, especially I would say in the Orthodox community, look askance at ecology because they think of it as this sort of hippie, tree hugger, pagan um, movement that is antithetical to Jewish values. Um, but as I'm trying to show in this presentation, and, and as I've written in the books that I, I've written, this is this is organic to Torah. To pray for what God created, to pray for the Bria, is a deep thing. There's nothing pagan about it. We're not we're not worshiping the earth. We're praying. <laughs> that we should be able to continue to survive and that the next generation and all species, all 8 million species that God created should be able to live in harmony and in balance on this planet. That's a beautiful prayer. And it's also an, an, an you know, an opening for interdenominational prayer uh, to, for, for Jews of many denominations to come together. And Perik Shira is a whole book of creation, praising God, the frogs, the birds, the lions, the rivers, the skies, all of this praises God. And nature themes are abundant in Psalms and in the Siddur. And so, so connecting to nature is, is a deep part of Jewish practice. Now, Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlov uh, recommended going into nature for an hour a day into the forests of, of the Ukraine and speaking to God, having alone time with God in nature. You know, it's 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 an amazing practice, but it's a practice that, that aside from, you know, maybe a few thousand breaths of Hasidim is is unfortunately not not common in Jewish practice today. Um, but it's it's a real point of opening for Jewish spirituality. Uh, there's an organization called Wilderness Torah that's that's trying to bring this out. Nate in Psalms, praise God, sun and moon, praise God, all bright stars. Prayers are the language of the soul. And by praying, we can affect ourselves and the world around us. So teaching number two brings us to Tubishvat and trees. Now, most, most Jews, when we talk about Jewish ecology, their response is Tubishvat. That's Jewish ecology. The birthday of the trees, the new year of the trees, Rosh Hashanah Le'ilan. And, and part of what I'm trying to do through this presentation and, and through, through my book Eco Bible, which is on 400 verses in the Torah, is to show that, that Jewish ecology is much greater than just to be shot in trees. Um, but I will for a couple minutes relate to this teaching as well, because trees are important. Uh, the, the Midrash says that when God created the first human being, he took him and showed him all the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to him, see how praise, everything I created, I created for you. See how praiseworthy and beautiful is my creation. 
be careful not to destroy or despoil it, for if you do, there will be no one after you to repair it. And, and some, some people say that we don't need to worry about ecology because God will just take care of it, but this is a direct refutation of that, of that idea that we can be irresponsible and that God will just clean up our mess. Can I, can I ask a question on this yeah. idea? Because you keep on making reference to it, right? Where there seems to be a disconnect. Sorry about that. There seems okay. to be sort of a disconnect, like you said, with the religious community and this very important topic. And I'm just wondering, are there any, is there any, um, because as you mentioned, it is a very new and hip concept and idea. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, ideas or concepts related with ecology that are based in, let's say, idolatry style thinking that may turn the religious community away from it? Like, why is there such a disconnect? Like you mentioned that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're calling it the, the eco Bible and it's an interfaith concept, which I think is really speaking to this generation, but what it like, since you're making so many Torah references and it's not only like biblical, it's, you know, modern rabbis and very rabbis, I think are generally like, you know, um, people value their opinions. Why is there a disconnect, would you say, with the, with the you know, religious community? Like, mm -hmm. where, where does that come from? And especially you keep on saying, like, all your sources are everything. I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm just saying, like, it does, it's all based off of very religious ideas. So why mm -hmm. is there, where does that come from? Yeah. Yeah. And that's also part of why I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning these different sources is because, you know, you, people can argue with me, but if if you think if someone thinks that what I'm saying is is incorrect, then you know just look at the sources, and and that's also why, as I mentioned, each of these 18 topics has a has a five page source sheet. With each source sheet has maybe 20 sources on it, and so together we've put together hundreds of sources, which which are also reflected in the in the ecological commentary that I've written. Um, but in regards to your question, I, I think it's actually um, partly, you know, what maybe a, a sociological phenomenon of where the ecological movement emerged in the 1960s and 1970s at the same time as the hippie movement uh, and the free love movement. Um, and, and so the ecological, the, many of the people during the 60s and 70s who were promoting ecological awareness were people who were also living a lifestyle that was not a, you know, it was not, a, let's call it an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle, you know, the, the free love movement and uh, drug use, et cetera. And so I think that because the beginning of the ecological movement arose during that time, a lot of religious people, not just in the Jewish community, but also among Christians, Muslims, and others, came to see the ecological movement as a, uh, you know, a very, as sort of a secular, um, very left-wing movement that was associated with values like drug use and free love that they opposed. Um, however, I think that that is a, uh, is a mistake because as I'm trying to show with these topics, the ecological awareness is not some sort of, um, you know, idea that, that goes together with drug use and sexual promiscuity. Ecological awareness is something that is organic to the Torah and is something that Rabbi Yochanan and Maimonides and Rabbi Akiva and Moshe Rabbeinu had and Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlov in, in, in a ways I, I would call them environmentalists, even though it's an anachronistic term, it didn't exist for them, but their behaviors, you know, Mo, Moses, Moshe spent most of his life before he, he, he helped redeem the Jewish people as a shepherd. And as a shepherd, he spent, you know, 99% of his work time outside in the desert with animals. And, and, and the same was true with, with 
David Amelech, King David, the same was true with Amos the prophet. God chose shepherds. Um, anyway, so that's that's one aspect of it. And I would say something, a second aspect of it, which is that in, in regards to your question, Nahami, um, in our times, materialism and consumer society has made very deep inroads into the Jewish community in, of all denominations. And an ecological lifestyle involves challenging consumer behavior and consumer society. As, as I said in my presentation, it involves putting spiritual values and, and Jewish values, community values ahead of seeking uh, our pleasure satisfaction in consumer goods and material society. I think that at some level, Jewish communities of all denominations have accepted consumer society as something that they want. And as a result, they, they deny ecology because ecological awareness is challenging the idea of putting consumer values front and center. Um, those would be my two, two, two points on, in relation to your question. My thing is, is that the consumer, the, your second point isn't necessarily directed at the Orthodox community. Yet within, let's say the secular community, they're more open to these ideas. When you come to, let's say the Orthodox community, that's where I don't know that this consumer answer is only specific to the Orthodox community. You know what I mean? It challenges the, the, the idea, but for everybody, yet we find the Orthodox community not being open to these ideas. That's, mm -hmm. I, and that's my general, like, you know, I would say without really knowing much, my, mm -hmm. what, I, what I believe to be true. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the, the Orthodox community is, is most resistant to, to, the, to, to ecological ideas. Um, at the same time, there's a wider, wider phenomena, phenomenon in the Jewish community that rabbis and Jewish educators of all denominations um, don't make ecological sustainability a priority. Uh, and so, you know, if my organization has a project in Los Angeles, for example, called the Los Angeles Faith and Ecology Network, unfortunately, there's no rabbi that, that joins the, the meetings. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's uh, of all denominations, it's, um, it's, it's widespread. Other comments or questions? Okay, so then I'm going to keep going with, with the presentation and then we'll take a five minute break. Um, uh, excuse me, I have a comment. One second. Mm -hmm. no problem with the double. Yes, yeah, so David, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, so my question the first vision is kind of a one is called the Spear Club. And I'm taking this for um, for the students, uh, you know, fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes period, roughly, and so maybe forty five minutes, fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes at the most. Uh, I'm trying to come and you know, bring it and probably fifteen minutes. But it is what you're showing now can be done in a more uh, reduced uh, you know. And at one second, can it be also this interactive or not? So is it as we move along? Okay, so David, I, I heard some of your question, but for some reason the, the audio isn't great. What I would suggest is if you could just type your question in one or two sentences in the chat box, um, then I would be happy, happy to address it. Um, So, um, and then I'll also just say a third thing in, in relation to your question, Nahami, which is that um, for thousands of years, you know, essentially since the Bar Kokhba, since the, the Roman, you know, destruction of the Second Temple and the, and the Bar Kokhba revolt 60 years after that, the Jewish people have, have been divorced from our land and from land in general. 
And, and, and for much of the past 2000 years, Jews in many countries were forbidden from owning land and from farming the land. As a result of that, Jews went into other professions. They were forced to become tax collectors and you know, small merchants and, and other professions that were not connected to, to working the land. And because of this, Jewish teaching moved away from, from emphasis on the land. The Mishnah has six orders. The first order of the Mishnah is Zrayim, on seeds and agriculture. But today, if you look at Jewish law, most Jewish law relates to ritual. You know, in my rabbinic training, we, we spent a year on, uh, on, on family purity, Tarat HaMishpacha. We spent a year on Shabbat. We spent a year on, uh, on Basar V'chalav uh, and, and Tarifot, uh, on Kashrut. So, so, so I think that there's also sort of a sociological aspect that we've, the Jewish people in general, have just become a, an urban, technological, post-industrial people and of where, you know, I mean, is, do, do any of you know of, of students who have parents who are farmers who actually work the land? I, I would imagine not. Um, okay, and again, um, David, if you wanna put your question in a chat, then um, we'd be happy to, to relate to it. I'm gonna continue with the presentation. Um, and um, so, so again, uh, teaching number 12 is on trees, which also relates to Tubishvat. This is a picture of, a, of an amazing tree. I'm actually on a Facebook group that has pictures of amazing trees. Uh, the Torah is called a tree of life. Eitz chayim hi lemachazikim bo. And it says in Mishle in Proverbs. And many Torah scrolls are wrapped around the wood of trees. Uh, Torah scrolls usually made of of, of today of cow skin, but traditionally they were made of 65 deer skins, the, the skin of 65 deer wrapped around a tree, which shows sort of the indigeneity of our people. Um, actually, when I was, after I went to URJ Camp George in Northern Ontario, um, I, there was a Native American gathering right near the camp and, and I went to it called the Potawatomi Gathering. And there was an author there who was a, uh, who wrote a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. Um, and, and there's, you know, the Jewish people were an indigenous people in the land of Israel, and we were very connected to the land. And Jewish teachings relate and reflect that, that aspect of our being indigenous. Uh, so there's also deep teachings about planting trees. The, the Torah says that just, the Midrash says that just as God planted trees as one of the first acts of God creating the world, so too we should emulate God and plant trees ourselves. And that's part of the basis for planting trees on Tubishvat. Teaching number 13 is a Jewish approach to food and sustainability. How we eat food, what type of food we, we eat is, are all deeply related to sustainability. There's actually an organization in Toronto called Shoresh, which is working on, on Judaism and, and food and farming and gardening. And there's an organization in New Jersey, Grow Torah, which is doing similar work. Holy eating, the, according to Rav Tzadok Cohen, the, the sin of Adam and Eve was not that they ate from the forbidden fruit, it was the way they ate that they took self-conscious, self-gratifying pleasure from the tree without connecting it to the source of God who gave it to them. Also with, with Esau, Esau and him eating the lentils, it says that he, by Yibez Esau et that he despised the birthright through his unconscious eating, that that, that verse is the paradigm of, of unholy eating. Um, and, and the verse right after that says, and there was a famine in the land, um, which shows the connection between our unholy eating and, and the bringing of famine. Um, the Zohar, the Jewish mystical book, talks about eating as the time of combat, eight krav, and of how we need to have mindfulness in our eating. We can't just, you know, put down a donut. Uh, Tihos, I understand, is popular in, in Canada. Ochel is an acronym of Eich, Kama, 
the lama. Ech, how much am I eating? Kama, how much am I eating? Lama, why am I eating? Am I eating out of desire to address an emotional issue that I'm going through? Is there a way that I can connect to my emotions and therefore not have to, to use food as my comfort? How fast am I eating? Am I doing other things when I'm eating? Where am I eating? Am I eating in front of a computer? Am I eating while I look at my, my smartphone? Am I eating with other people? These are all, all spiritual questions about eating that, that I think are also ecological questions because, because food is, is one of the key, food has a huge ecological footprint. In, in the Torah, the, the sages um, comment on the, the, it's actually this week's Torah portion, Parshat Vayachi, that, um, that when, when Yaakov, Jacob blesses his sons, Many of the blessings relate to food and, and, and a particular aspect of the land of Israel. So, so Judah is blessed with uh, abundant grapes. Asher is blessed with abundant uh, olives and olive oil. Zebulun lives by the sea and, and has access to, to fish. And, uh, and each of these tribes would trade with each other. There's a, a biblical economy in the land of Israel, local regional trading. In our times, the food is so globalized. It comes from so many places. We actually, here in Israel, you, you might be surprised to know that Israel today carries a good amount of Canadian food products. Uh, there's, in the health food stores in particular, there are a lot of foods that are made in Canada, like rice pasta uh, and, um, and applesauce uh, and maple syrup, obviously. Um, that, that, are, that are made in Canada and that have uh, the Canadian kosher certification. Um, but when we get food that's global in nature, there's a huge carbon footprint uh, and, and that carbon will stay in the atmosphere for, for 100 years. And so part of, part of a Jewish approach to food and sustainability is returning to holistic consumption of food. I'll also just pause in case there's any comments or questions. Okay, so I'm going to do teaching number 14, um, and, uh, and then I think we'll take a five-minute break, and then um, we'll continue with the second hour, because we're now about an hour in. So the, so the 14th teaching is Tsar Balei Chaim, which uh, you could translate as the, the pain of animals, but is, is a principle about being compassionate to animals. God is good to all, and his mercy is upon all his works. In Psalms, Tov Adonai Lakol V'Rachamav Al-Kol Ma'asav, we say it in Ashrei, praying traditionally several times a day. Judaism stresses the need to treat animals with compassion. Pointless pain is strictly prohibited, and Jewish law instructs us to go out of our way to avoid an animal suffering. And again, Tsar Bailey Chaim is considered one of the 613 commandments. So, so it's not like I'm, I'm saying like these obscure things. Many of these 18 topics are based on, on what are considered part of the, the essential 613 commandments, the Tariag Mitzvot. So while on the one hand, we have these deep Jewish teachings about being compassionate to animals and that emphasize how, how Moshe was compassionate to animals. That's why God selected him to be the shepherd of Israel, how David was compassionate to animals. Yet at the same time, the way we treat animals today is, is, is terrible. 80 billion land and sea animals are in factory farms. When I, when I go to a chicken shed, near Jerusalem, right, right next to the Hadassah in Karim Hospital on the outskirts of Jerusalem. There's a, a Moshav Evans up here with has chicken sheds. I imagine in Canada, the, the, the factory farms are, are sort of fenced off. Um, but, but in Israel, you can just you know, go right next to it and see the way the animals are. When I do that, I have a spiritual experience. And it's, it's an experience of the smell and the, the sound of, of thousands of chickens in an industrial shed. And when I had that, that spiritual experience is that, wow, I'm seeing something that is horrific. God clearly does not want this on, on, on earth. 
this is terrible. And, and the, the study, the, 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 my understanding of Jewish teachings is that God wants us to be compassionate to animals, but the way that we treat animals today shows no compassion. The animals are essentially slaves. They're living miserable existences. And, and the, the, the cows pictured here are living a free range life. Um, but the, the most chickens and, and most kosher eggs and dairy and meat is, is grown in ways that is antithetical to, to Jewish values. Uh, I'll also just mention that the first coronavirus cases were in a live animal market in Wuhan. That the coronavirus epidemic, I realize that there's some debate about this, you know, but, but according to, to the, you know, many scientists, the, the, the pandemic we're in began in an animal market. It was transferred from a bat in a cave uh, to probably to a pangolin. And that pangolin transferred it to a person. A pangolin is like a, 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 a scaly anteater. Uh, and so this crisis epidemic is, is a zoonotic epidemic, meaning it's an epidemic of a disease that transferred from animals to people. And, and, and there were many such cases in the past 20 years, like, uh, like MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that transferred from camels to people, um, like avian bird flu that transferred from birds to people. Um, and so this and, and mad cow disease that transferred also. Um, so on the positive side, we can embrace more of a plant-based diet. And there are, for those who eat meat, there are some suppliers that provide non-cage, grass-fed, antibiotic-free kosher meat. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, in Canada, I know that Grow and Behold Foods is in upstate New York, which is, as you know, not far from Montreal. Okay, so we're gonna pause. I'd like us to take a five minute break and then, and then we'll continue with the last few teachings and then I'll share. Anyone wants to include a comment in the chat, you're welcome to do so as well. So, this the, the, in Okiro with the guy, she's to hear two minutes with him and where's me? I have a problem with my camera, but I want to go. Okay, so, so David, we can now hear you. Now we can hear your audio. Because what I did was I closed my eye closed, okay? And and I, uh, so anyway, so I'm happy you heard me because you spoke up highly about you. So I'm happy you heard uh -huh. me. Two minutes. No, just because I'm, I'm uh, my question was, and then I closed, is, is what you're doing now for two hours, can that be conduced for, for, um, for about an hour for students roughly? And can, can, can any of it can be, um, uh, how should I, in, in, um, you know, um, uh, come on, I had the word before, I said it before. Uh, interactive, that's all I'm asking. Thank you. I'll mute myself now, thank you. Yeah, so so I'm I'm able to teach on any of these 18 topics as well as other ones like a Jewish approach to climate change. Um, and, and yes, this can be more interactive. Um, like for example, we could do uh, breakout sessions where we have uh, you know, Jewish text study of where I present a, a, a source and then we do breakout sessions. I, I decided not to do breakout sessions here just because I thought that, you know, for it would just be more effective to, for it to be more of a frontal session, but, but yes, th these can be more interactive um, using breakout sessions and, and, you know, my asking questions to the participants. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the screen share. Um, so this is Jewish Ecology in 18 Topics. Teacher number 15, we're almost at the end, is energy. How do we use energy wisely and in resonance with Jewish values? So according to the Talmud, Marzutra said that inefficient fuel burning is bal tashrit, is the prohibition of waste wasting. And he gives the example of, of burning an oil lamp inefficiently. In our times, leaving appliance on during Shabbat without timers, when we can use timers, there's no point in, in wasting energy for heaters and lights and, and hot plates that that don't need to be used for, for 25 hours on, on Shabbat. 
Um, So Jewish sages called for a prudent path of energy consumption, which can teach us to reduce our excessive fossil fuel use. Uh, and this also relates to air pollution, because when we, when we waste energy, we create more air pollution. And there are also rabbinic laws about protecting the beauty of Jerusalem and the air. The sages, Jewish sages said that the air of Jerusalem was, was smelled like the incense from the temple, and that as far away as Jericho, they could smell the, the incense smell, the pleasant smell of Jerusalem. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1981, 40 years ago, <clears throat> called for the Jewish community and the entire United States to switch to, to away from oil that was coming from uh, the Arab countries and to, among other sources, switch to solar power. He said that the US South could provide enough energy for the entire United States, the Southwest, like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. Uh, and, and just today, 40 years later, that's starting to happen. Um, but he was a visionary. He saw that 40 years ago. Okay. The 16th teaching, being a good neighbor. Hilchot Shrenim. There's a whole, it says in, in, in Vaikra, Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. According to Rabbi Akiva. And, and there's a whole section of the Talmud, Hilchot Shrenim, about uh, environmental damages between neighbors of polluting the water, the air, the soil. Uh, and Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch expanded this to, under, to say that we need to consider the welfare of other living beings on the planet. And so there's, there's a whole, whole hal halachic, Jewish legal aspect of being a good neighbor, distancing sources of damage from and within populated areas. Uh, in, in, in Alberta, the, the tar sands is causing tremendous damage to indigenous communities, First Nation communities that are they're downstream of the pollution from this huge industrial operation. And uh, so how do we do it? How do we be a good neighbor? We can stop and think before doing anything that may have a negative impact on other people or on the environment we all share. Teaching number 17, guard yourselves very well. Ushmartem et nashotechem, protecting our health. The, in, in, in Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy, Moses says, choose life, uvacharta b'chayim. So we have a mitzvah to guard our physical health. And the Rambam talks about a healthy lifestyle. Yet in our times, there's a lot of different aspects of, that are unhealthy, whether it's pesticides, and, and there's increasing use of pesticides, and there's link, linkages between the use of pesticides and cancer. Lo aleinu. So... Organic farms is one aspect, eating, eating healthy food and staying away from junk, junk food. Israel's chief Sephardi rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Amar, uh, spoke about uh, the, 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 he was the previous Sephardi rabbi. He spoke about, you know, the old fashioned way of, of checking uh, leave, green leafy vegetables the way that they used to do it instead of just relying on heavily pesticided uh, what they call Gush Katif variety. And the last of the 18 teachings is the glory in creation, valuing biodiversity. That God, you know, God could have created a world that only had a few species, but instead God created one with, with 8 million species. And the, the, the Talmudic sage Rav said, of all the things that the Holy One blessed me, he created in this world, he created nothing without a purpose. So everything has a purpose, including the spiders and the scorpions and the snakes. And God's glory is expressed by the sages through the multitude of species and their ability to procreate the olam forever. The Ramban, Nachmanides in particular, talks about the, the, this being a mitzvah to, to maintain species, and, and it's, a, it's forbidden to, to extinct species in our time. We're causing the, 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 uh, the human, the great mass extinction event called the Anthropocene. Um, and the Rambam said, in every generation, new benefits from herbs and types of fruits are discovered that were not known earlier, and many benefits are derived from them. 
So when we destroy the rainforest and the rainforests are burning, the, the boreal forests of Canada are burning. So then we're losing biodiversity. So that's, those are the 18 topics. Hopefully it's helping to, it will help to deepen your teaching on Judaism and ecology. Here's my email address, which I can also put in the chat. Um, and, um, and so that's sort of part one of my presentation. Um, and maybe let me just pause here and, and see if there's any comments or questions at this point. So it, it, David, if you're trying to talk or if anyone wants to talk, then please unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna- I just wanna know, you can, you can hear me fine now? Yeah, can now we can hear you. you. Okay, thank you, so just uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're gonna now go on to part two of this three-part presentation. Um, which is, I'm gonna share with you now a few resources that are available on Judaism and ecology of curricula for Jewish day schools that you can make use of. Uh, it's, you know, Loba he it's not in heaven and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to, you know, create a whole new curriculum yourself. You're welcome to do so, but there are curricula that exist that, uh, that you can make use of. And I'm gonna share with you a few of these resources. Um, and I, if I could just ask, has anyone here taught previously on Judaism and ecology in a, you know, one course or multiple, multiple classes? So you have, a couple of you have, maybe you could just say a word about what, what you've taught on. Um, you can hear me? Yeah. Hi, I'm Shir. I'm a Tanakh teacher at uh, Tenenbaum Chat uh, in Toronto. Uh, I currently teach grade nines and tens. As you can see, I'm at school in between lunch duties to other things, but now students are back in class and I took uh, a little break to uh, attend this, um, this Zoom. It is very interesting and I wanted to thank you. Um, previously for over 20 years, I've been teaching the elementary grades uh, before starting to teach high school. And I've taught a junior high course when we used to live in Calgary, at the Calgary Jewish Academy, Academy, which was an enrichment course. It was one of the electives that was offered. And um, I taught them, I, I actually made the course up for them. I called it Judaism and the Environment. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, bought, so when you're talking about um, resources, I actually found very useful for them um, a book through Berman House that was um, that was kind of a journal that they can follow. And I expanded the topics. I know it was a little bit young for them for a grade six or seven, but they didn't come with any knowledge. And so it served the purpose very, very well and was very interesting. So, and students loved it. Uh, every year I had more and more registration for this elective. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the burning minds of people. You know, you hear about it, but you never actually sit and learn it and study it. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that is it, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for sharing. And I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you've taught a course on Judaism and ecology. Yeah, three it's amazing. Times. It's three, three times, yeah, it's so three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know what? In Calgary, you're surrounded by a lot of nature. And, you know, in comparison, you can also look a little bit at the way of how people live. And I found that the awareness to your surrounding is much bigger than, you know, living now in Toronto, where you see that, you know, even like picking up after yourself, you know, when you went to hikes, I knew that everyone brought with them something, you know, that they put aside, you know, in terms of putting away your garbage to, you know, to even salt that is used on the roads, you know, for protecting, part of it is nature, part is to protect your cars, but a lot of it has to do with nature as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the water and, so it's kind of interesting because I think the people that you see in different societies, there are definitely a reflection of, you know, the things that you are, you're doing and, you know, your hierarchy, what is, 
you're used to. There's definitely some teaching going on from, you know, from generation to generation in, mm -hmm. in every school. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, thank, thank you. you. D does anyone else want to share about any, any teaching that you've done on Jewish ecology in the past or currently? Yes. Hi, I'm Tova. I'm teaching in Herzliya in the high school and uh, all these subjects is very known. They are very, the student and the, we have a, a unit in secondary three about ecology. And then when I'm teaching, you know, from all the sources, most of the sources that you show us now, and the, the students love it. And you know, they see that it's from the Judaism and we enjoying so much. And every year we're doing a different uh, a project also. Maybe we're collecting uh, stuff to give away or to recycling or all kinds of things. And it's very, very interesting the subject. The students love the subject. It's a young, and it's a yeah. Yes, we actually could. Thank you, Soba. Yes, it's a unit actually. Yachas Samoreshet Le Ecologia, with uh, we went to the first few um, sources you brought. Actually, we you know that's what we follow with the Federation, obviously. You know, Lo Davil Shomra, talking about also uh, noise pollution as part of it as well. The Zibu, the whole thing about you know, uh, uh, you know, how about the in Yerushalayim, as you know. By the time of the Mikdash, how these to you know, remove all the all the the uh, the you know, the, the junk, whatever it is outside the city. So there's certainly um, all of that. It's it's you know Kadamet Sade, you know the, the Malchashkit uh, uh, components. So all, all of these things are there, for Hashem. And it's, it's nice, yes. So it's, we we it's a unit actually we have, and um, and you know different stories from here and there from, from the Talmud. So. Sure. Uh, do you guys teach it at a high school level or elementary? High school level, yeah, high school level. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, so you know, if if you have resources that you've developed that you could share, then this could also be a collaborative. You know, I I, I don't have I don't know of all the resources that exist. I didn't know that that you taught on this. So perhaps you know you could share it with with others on this call in in, in Canada. Um, Where is Herzliya High School? Celia's in Montreal. Ah, in Montreal, Montreal. Montreal. okay. <laughs> the, I've heard it before, but I wasn't sure. Yes. Yeah, we're about, about 100, 130 years already, roughly. Okay. In existence, yeah, no. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. One thing I wanted to add that just came to my mind, which was a very interesting unit for the students. Uh, I, I mean, it was a, quite a few years ago because now I'm in high school, but uh, we s spoke quite a bit about Migdal Bavel and we connected it to environment and ethics of avodah, you know, the resources, how much do you reach, you know, and people like it because in many schools now that they have business studies and they're thinking all the time of building and building and building and building. It was quite interesting to connect this unit. They quite enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. is something as well, yes. So, so in in uh, this, this book, uh, Eco Bible, Eco Torah. So we have a couple of commentaries about Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Babel, in relation to the kingdom, the kingdom of Sumeria, which is where it existed, which represented the arrogance of the world's early farmers who thought their own work cultivated their prosperity. And um, there's a lot of deep teachings um, that because that that society actually declined because according to, to scientists, due to unsustainable agricultural practices, which created rising salt content in the soil of the agricultural field. So, so I love, David, you said about, uh, the, or, or, or Shir, you said about salting the, 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 the roads because of snow. So there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of deep things. So I'm going to turn now to a few, you know, we have about half an hour left. Um, I'm going to turn to, to a few resources. Um, that, that you could use. Um, and um, I'm also gonna do a screen share um, for this. Um, so, okay. So first of all, one organization is called Chazon. 
that you might be familiar with, Chazon is actually the largest Jewish environmental organization. And on their website, on chazon.org, they have a curriculum that they developed called Min Haaretz. It's a 288-page curriculum with teacher's guides and student worksheets, an interdisciplinary cur curriculum that weaves together Jewish tradition and contemporary food issues. So you can see here, this was something they developed. Um, so, um, okay, and here's the table of contents. I'll just talk about it for a minute. Um, unit one to grow. There's also seeds, earth, animals. Unit two to harvest. Agricultural practices, holidays, Jewish foods. To prepare kashrut, whole foods, the carbon footprint of food miles. To eat, you know, the blessing of hamotzi um, and bread and birkat hamazon. Uh, to sustain reduce, reuse, recycle, moderation, caring for our bodies. Okay, so that that is part one, which is the teacher's guide. Okay, that's a 126 page teacher's guide. Part two is a family curriculum, cooking, a farm trip, farmer's market. Okay, that's, you know, another like 30 pages. And then they have student worksheets here, um, which is its own numbering system. But that, that was, so the, the part one was this, the teacher's component of this curriculum. And now part three is another, you know, 100 pages of student worksheets that relate to it. Um, so that's a whole curriculum. You could, I'm sure, spend, devote a lot of time to that from Chazon. Um, and they actually developed a second curriculum called Gan Nashim, which, um, is, these are also available, this is the Chazon website. Um, they have a, a store, um, the, the download here doesn't actually work and I, I just emailed them about it. Um, this is from 2014. Um, so they have some resources. There's also an organization in, in Toronto called Shoresh, Canadian Soil Jewish Roots. They offer a, a, an outdoor school which is bridging Jewish learning and hands-on nature-based experiences. Um, and they offer outdoor educator training. Um, so this would be a different form of professional development for, for those in, in Toronto, or maybe they offer it elsewhere. Um, and they also have a, a B'nai Mitzvah journey that's, that's ecological. Um, so they're, they're the leading Jewish environmental organization in Canada. Uh, a third organization that I mentioned earlier is called Grow Torah, and they, they assimilated Confein and Sharim. So here you can see this is a weekly Parsha. Uh, they have a section on their website. I, I actually worked with, with, with them and, and developed this, this section um, of, of where you can go, and, and we're here in Breshit. Uh, and so on the weekly Torah portion, Parshat Shavua, they have an, an article, an ecological article on each Torah portion, as well as a source sheet. Um, and then they have a resources section that has some tutorials, um, and they're a, a Jewish gardening organization primarily. Um, those are those are a few things. And, and also on the Confine Sharim website, they also have this is a different uh, presentation of the 54 Torah portions with an ecological article on each Torah portion. Uh, so another set of resources are Jewish ecological infographics. And these are this is, this is on the website of Jewish Eco Seminars, which is my organization. Um, and I'm going to just take you through these infographics. Um, because this is, you know, it's a lot of people think that religion is one thing or Judaism is one thing and ecology is another, but we've tried to present graphically how, um, how to do this. And, and I, I distributed these at, at Camp URJ in, in Ontario, 
And we actually distributed these to 18 Jewish day schools in the United States. If you're interested in a printed set of these materials, um, we're, we're, we're selling them at a reasonable cost. Um, I'll just take you through them briefly that the, the seven days of creation, uh, land animals created together with people on the sixth day and the sea life and the birds and insects on the fifth day. Uh, that it's interesting that we didn't get our own day. We were created on the same day as the animals. And there's a verse in Tehilim, Ma rabu ma'asecha Adonai kulam b'chochma asita mal'ah ha'aretz kinyanecha. How many are your works, God? All of them you've made with wisdom. The earth is full of your creations. And the Malbim, Rabbi Meir Leibush said, what does, it, what does it mean of Marabu Ma'asecha Bibrio Shonot with the diversity of creatures? So here's a picture of a, of a desert. People think that a desert has no life, but actually there's a lot of life. It just comes out at night usually or in the winter. And an ecosystem is this is has their different roles. So these are predators, these are secondary consumers, these are decomposers. So this is the first of, of five Jewish eco-infographics. I'll just briefly take you through the others. This one is on Noah's Ark. Um, and uh, as I said to you, this, is, this shows graphically the midrash I shared earlier, um, that Noah planted trees, cut them down, made the Ark, and then brought the animals on board. Um, and the animals, why didn't they eat each other? How come the lion didn't eat the snake or the, the rooster? Any ideas? Well, it's because. Bobby, can you go down? We cannot see all the whole picture. Yeah, I'll, 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 go, I'll go to this part in a minute, but I just want to okay. focus on this question for a moment of why didn't the animals eat each other on the ark? It was because. In, in the first chapter of Genesis, God said to people, eat plants. And God said to animals, eat plants. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. It was very good. And so the simple understanding is that the animals were all vegetarian at that time. That was the, that's the simple meaning. And people were vegetarian. Only after the flood did the animals and people begin to eat each other. And so here we can see seven animal groups. There's actually the most number of anthropods by far. These are like beetles, but insects. We don't, are you showing anything? Because I only see like, uh, I don't know about everyone else, but are, are you, it's moving or is it, I see it's like it's just a screen. I don't know, just trying to say, am I, am I the only one guys? No, we, we all see the same screen. It just says That's biodiversity right. and animal welfare, yeah. the original. On the Jewish uh, ecoseminars.com, just one screen. It hasn't moved. Okay, okay, so it's not moving. Okay, it's fine. It's okay, fine. It's, you know, I don't, you, you're saying different things, but nothing is moving on the screen. I see. Interesting. Okay, so thanks for bringing that to my attention. Um, yeah. Okay, so then I will do something else. Um, now you see the web page? That's what we see. That's what we've been seeing all along. Now we see it moving. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So in other words, what we've tried to do with these resources is to enable people um, actually here into a new share. I see. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Now you can see, you can, you see, what do the animals teach us? Okay, great. So here are six animal groups. Um, and there's a verse in, in the book of Job, God teaches us by the animals of the earth and makes us wiser by the birds of the sky. Here at the top, I was talking about the Noah's Ark, and this is the graphic presentation of, of the Midrash. Um, and the, the first infographic is, is about the animals here in the desert. And, and um, this the, the third one is about infographic is about relating to animals. Um, here are seven verses about how do we relate to animals. I'm not going to go through all seven, but um, just one of them is that in uh, that, that Rivka, Rebecca said, drink and I will also water your camels. The test that Eliezer 
Abraham's servant had for whether Rebecca would be a suitable mate for Yitzchak was whether she cared for and watered the, ant, the camels. And camels actually drink a tremendous amount of water. So, so Rivka was likely drawing you know, water for maybe an hour to water the camels. That was the, that was the test. Uh, and here's six other teachings. Um, and, and so here's a picture of farming as it was in, in olden times with many people would eat meat maybe once a month, uh, depending on where they were. But in, in our times, we have a very different system of factory farming and where we're consuming meat or dairy and eggs, oftentimes at every meal. The fourth infographic is, is, a, is about a healthy and compassionate lifestyle based on, as I said, Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, where God essentially says to people, eat plants. It's one of the few things that God says to people in the first chapter of, of Bereshit and of how moving toward a plant-based diet helps with, with skin and blood pressure and body mass index, cholesterol, energy. And, and here are seven food groups. A lot of people think, well, lettuce is the only thing, but actually there's beans, oil, grain, nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables. Um, and a technique called square foot gardening could potentially produce enough food for one person with just 1.5 square meters. The last infographic on Judaism is on, on trees, which relates to two bishvat. There's, there's a midrash that uh, Adam took the first trees of the Garden of Eden. He took, he took saplings out from the, the garden. He brought it to, Mo, to Noah, who passed down to Shet, and Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, who, who brought the saplings down to Egypt, actually in, in last week's parasha. And then in this week's parasha, when, when Jacob is dying, he says to his sons to bring, uh, to uh, plant these saplings in the land, um, which they do. And then when they're leaving Egypt, they cut them down, they bring them through the sea and they make the trees into the Mishkan. And that's the meaning of the verse in, in Psalms. Az kol Hashem ki then the trees of the field sang before God who came to judge the earth. Um, this, is, this is based on a midrash, and it's also teaching a rabbi Ibn Shawiv of Spain. Um, and and if, so the question is, why did the tree sing? Maybe you could, any ideas on why, why the trees sang before God? If they, were, they were dead. They, they'd already been cut down. They were going to be used for sacred work. Very nice. They're going to be used for Kedusha. And they weren't just, you know, uh, a McDonald's wrapper, but this was the Mishkan. The Mishkan lasted for hundreds of years. Other ideas? So, you know, the, the, it was sacred long-term, and it was also by the people who were in relationship with the trees. Has anyone here cut down a tree? Do you know anyone who's cut down a tree? Maybe. So most people in our times have never cut down a tree. Most people in our times have never slaughtered an animal. But there are people who, who cut down trees or slaughter animals. Shir, you wanted to say? No, I'm saying, you know, we often teach two bishvat, so we plant trees. We often, I don't know too many people, unless you have a tree in your garden that has to for certain, you know, maybe safety reasons, but... You know, we do, I don't think on a, in our life today, we, I know too many people that would cut down by themselves a tree. Not to say mm -hmm. that I, I know many people that would take it very much to heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it's amazing, you know, yeah, most people and most Jews have never cut down trees. Um, and, and there's actually rabbinic teachings about, you know, as we said earlier, not cutting down fruit trees in war. Um, at the same time, my organization has a blog and on uh, the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development and one of our new posts is gonna be on hemp toilet paper. You know, most, it, it's, it's crazy that we would cut down an old growth tree, you know, a tree that's lived for thousands of years in order to use it for toilet paper. Uh, and so sometimes I say, it's, you know, it's a little bit far-fetched, but it's a good thing to plant trees on Tu Bishvat, but maybe we should also cut down some trees and use them, 
you know, use them ourselves because in a society where we don't, we are connected to, to the way that we use things, it's easy to just take it for granted. We don't, you know, when we click on Amazon, we don't really think about it. We don't think about the trees that were involved. And maybe if we cut down trees or if we slaughter animals, you know, if you learn to be a, a shochet, a, a Jewish slaughterer, or, or at least watched an animal slaughter, um, I realize that that's probably too much for, you know, elementary and middle school kids. Um, but uh, those, are, those are just some, some food for thought. So I'll pause here. Any comments or questions? Da David, are you trying to, to speak? Yeah, I, I, I had a question and I just blanked out. I just had a question right after you started to feel out. I blanked out. I was trying to speak, yeah. Okay. Um, so if 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 no one has other comments or questions, then I'll just I'll just share. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so, behavior. But if I had sentence originally. It says somewhere about Shemitah and Hon. Yeah. So I, I, so I'm just wondering, as we close to the end, I mean, we heard everything, I guess, about that Shemitah itself, or did you, was it, I mean, I thought that would be the, the overriding uh -huh. theme, Kahevanti. Uh, oh, I loved all what we heard today, definitely. And uh, so that's the question, unless I misread the email. No, that, that's correct. The, the email talked about Tu Bishvat and Shemitah. So those were, those were two of the 18 topics, but I'll say a little bit more about Shemitah. Um, so in Israel, um, I, I can't speak for, for how it's like in Toronto, but in Israel, most Jews, most who observe you know, Jewish practice, their observance of Shemitah is relating to what type of food they buy in the store. Do they buy from Heter Mechira, the permission to sell the land um, that was based on you know, an old tradition from, from the late 1800s when the, the Jewish community was very small in the land and that um, the, 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 the Great Rav of Kovno renewed in the, in the sabbatical year of 1888, and that Rav Cook renewed in, in his first sabbatical year in, uh, I believe, 1909, um, and which is now practiced by, by most Jewish farmers in the land. Um, or will they buy from what's called Otzel Beit Din, where there's a, uh, a uh, collection, a sort of a collective um, that doesn't profit from the sales, but rather um, sells the the food to consumers in a in a without gaining profit from from the land in the sabbatical year. Um, or will they buy it from Palestinian and Jordanian farmers, which is uh, who don't aren't obligated in in observing the laws of of shemitah, the sabbatical year. Uh, that's a third option. Or a fourth option is, many, is some farmers will put a thick plastic sheet on their greenhouse. Um, and, and, and because they're, they're producing crops in a greenhouse and with a thick plastic sheet that separates the, 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 the actual ground from the, what they're farming on, um, that's considered not growing produce in the land of Israel. That, that actually has a significant ecological footprint because then after the sabbatical year, they throw out the thick plastic. Um, so those are four options that people think about during the sabbatical year in terms of where should they get their produce. I would like to and any, suggest... any of these Any of these four would be, what would you call, I mean, if you're trying to understand, those are humra. Someone's very machmir and it's, you know, like, you know, I don't know what I call it, the, 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 the most, I don't know, this, or this. Is there like levels of, they are take a share, this, a hot kasher, this is more, I mean, or it's all just understanding that, the, you know, these different types of, you know what I mean? Kilo, yeah. This, so, would it? yeah. Well, 
within most of the Haredi communities, the most stringently observant communities in Israel, my understanding is that the, the preference is to buy produce from non-Jews. Um, so, so during the sabbatical year, uh, Palestinian and Jordanian agriculture uh, increases significantly. And the price of produce from those two countries increases. Um, but it's not just from them. It's also from produce that's shipped from Mediterranean countries or from Latin America or the United States. Um, but from an ecological perspective, you know, buying, buying such produce, there are certain factors. One factor is that, uh, you know, if, if produce is shipped a long distance, then there's a carbon footprint. Um, and also Palestinian and Jordanian agriculture uses more pesticides than Israeli agriculture. It's, uh, the Palestinian Jordanian agriculture is sort of, you know, from several decades ago, it, it hasn't modernized in the same way that Israeli agriculture has. And so there tends to be more pesticide use. So um, from the FDA, FDA, I'm going to think of America, but from that, that what's the equivalent in Israel, uh, the, I guess the bureau, I guess that looks over all that, that's all passes by in terms of, so the Eter Mechira, from one of view, is from the Haredi world, is not really the most, you know, sedem to use, and therefore it has to be produced from out of, uh, out of town, out of Israel. But in terms of the, what's the FDA, uh, I guess, regulation over Canada, that's what we call here, in, I guess, in Canada, the States, the FDA, but I guess the, 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 the you know, the, it, all the pesticides, that's okay, really? that's, it's, uh, it's all these regulations that Israel has, the over, right over, don't, don't, don't see it because it's uh, Shemitah here and it's okay, or it's, you know, well, first of all, I mean, my sense is about half the people on this call are are Israeli, um, and so and and for those who aren't native Israeli but have been to Israel, so you're probably aware that you know there's there's less regulation in Israel than in the United States and Canada. So you know the FDA and the Canadian you know Agricultural Inspections Department, I, I would say, are probably more rigorous in their standards. Uh, and I, I, I don't know the, the full answer to your question about how, how does Israel regulate Palestinian and Jordanian produce? I didn't um, think, by the way, by the way I, maybe, maybe you thought it's, but I personally didn't, didn't think that you know, Israel would be much more lenient. I didn't think so, by the way. So it's a uh, hidush for me, anyway, personally. Uh, I didn't know. Being because so much avant-garde and so many other things, the, the technology and the irrigation and so many other things, I would say, think that uh, probably there's some up there uh, personally that's my uh... yeah well you know another aspect of of this is that there are some jewish israeli farmers during the sabbatical year who don't want to uh go according to the heter mechira the this sort of fictitious land sale to non-jews um and for whatever reason they're not they they, they don't want to um, do that. And so what they do is they secretly and illegally sell their produce to Palestinian farmers who then will sell the produce for the, the Haredi market. That's what the Mishnah is saying. That's the, the fourth uh, element, I guess. Of, uh, and uh, here's, the, here's actually, uh, here it is. <laughs> it's the Haredi yeah. Kubia. And right in one of them is the Haredi Right? I mean, that's right yeah. there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and so for that reason, there are some, you know, Dati Le Umi religious nationalist Jews who don't want to buy from Palestinian and Jordanian farmers because both, you know, because they don't want to support such farmers, um, but also because there's a chance that, that the produce is actually grown by, Israel, by Jewish Israeli farmers and is done in a, and it actually has what's called Kedusha Shvi'it, but is, it's not known that that's the case. Um, but as I said earlier in my presentation, I actually think that, that the focus in among many religious Jews on what store or what heksher, what kosher certification you buy the produce from is actually missing the bigger point of Shemitah that is, that emerges from the Torah. Because the, the Torah is clear. God, God wants 
the Jewish people to rest and for the land to rest in the sabbatical year. And, and, and in, in today's time, there are very few Jewish farmers who actually work the land. Most Jews who work in agriculture are actually overseeing industrial operations where the, the agricultural work is done by, farm, by, by workers from Thailand and the Philippines and India and Nepal and China. And, and the Jews who are working there tend to be sort of running an industrial operation. Uh, um, and and so, so I feel like the, the, the most germane question um, for, you know, to, to, for Jews to think about this sabbatical year is really, what does it mean for our lifestyles this year? How, how is our lifestyle different this year than, than the other six years? We're not farmers. None of us are farmers. What does it mean for Jews who work as doctors or lawyers or accountants or teachers? What does the sabbatical year mean? How, how is it different for us? And, and, and it's sort of a meta question. I realize that the halakha doesn't talk about that, um, but I think it's an important question to think about um, what do we do different this year in terms of the education, in terms of our relation to technology, our relationship to work, our relationship to people, our relationship to land. And, you know, and so one thing that I suggest is to go out more into the land. Uh, if it's possible here in Israel to try to harvest from the, the produce that has been made hefker, that has been made ownerless by the farmers, um, but, but just to walk the land. God said to Abraham to walk the width and breadth of the land. That was one of the, 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 the first things God said to Abraham when he came to the land of Israel and to go into nature. You know, this is God's creation. Uh, and the sabbatical year, I think, gives us an opportunity to do that and to really connect in a, in a deeper way to, to the beauty of, of nature. Other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, Shalom. Hello. Shalom. Yes. I would like uh, to ask, I, I'm Joseph from Herzliya, uh, about uh, the uh, Shnat Shemitah. The intent of the uh, Shemitah at the origin was in fact to let the land uh, or the soil to regain its uh, nutrition or fertility. And uh, th this is in fact a practice that uh, was a good one and intelligent one. And it took to the Europeans about 1000 years to uh, be forced to learn that and, and to apply that in the middle ages. They got to that by having no choice. With the time and with having uh, modern fertilizers, so uh, we have technology uh, to take into account to, to, or to give the land to, to, to regain its nutrition. Is there any uh, rabbi uh, halacha that takes the advancement in technology and knowledge and uh, adding the nutrition to, to the land uh, into account? Uh, or we just stick to what it says, Shnat Shmita is Shnat Shmita, and, and uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question. Um, I would say a couple things about it. Um, so first of all, the research on, key, on, on the benefit of keeping fields fallow shows an increase of about 15% in crop yields. Um, and, and there's an additional benefit of, of not working for a period of time of, uh, of not using chemical fertilizers and pesticides and not compacting the earth with heavy combines, which are these large farming machines. There's research that indicates that, you know, a combine can weigh about 53,000 pounds on, on one axle, on one side alone. So, so there's other benefits of, of leaving it fallow aside from, from you know, especially in our times. Um, and I, look, I'm not aware of rabbinic sources as, as you're asking that talk about um, whether, you know, we should be, you know, not, not observing Shemitah because of fertilizers. But I'll, but I'll say sort of a, a different approach to it is that there, there are studies that are indicating that fertilizers are degrading 
the quality of, of, of the soil and that industrial agriculture is degrading the quality of the soil. There's a study that, that we quote in Eco Bible Volume 1 that talks about how, how much of the soil in the Midwestern United States from the corn, the huge corn fields and soybean fields is now degraded. It, 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 the soil used to be very thick, very deep, the topsoil, but because they've been doing intensive agriculture nonstop for you know, 150 years, the, so the topsoil is now extremely thin. And so I think that this idea of letting the land rest for a year, you know, it's, it's deeper than, uh, than what we might understand today. Uh, and, 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 you know, the wisdom of the Torah, I mean, that's, and I'll, maybe I'll just conclude with this because I realized that we're at the end of the hour, which is that the wisdom of our tradition in regards to ecological sustainability is what the world needs now. This, this isn't just about, you know, engaging young Jews and making it interesting to them. I, I, I firmly believe that the, the tafkid, the role of the Jewish people in this time is to show the world a sustainable path based on our spiritual traditions. Our, our traditions of Shabbat and Shemitah and Bal Tashchit and Tzar Baalei Chaim, the 18 topics that I said and, and the 400 commentaries that, that I mentioned, this is wisdom that the world needs. And we and the Jewish people can be an Orla Goyim. I mean, you guys are there in Canada, in, you know, you're in Winnipeg and Montreal and Toronto. The, the, we have the ability to be an Orla Goyim for our institutions to be leaders of sustainability. If, if your schools, if the Herzliya High School, you know, if there's an article in the Montreal newspaper about your leadership on, on Judaism and ecology, that's a kiddush Hashem. That's that's the, the 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 Christians in Montreal will say, "Wow, look at what how the Jews are connecting this." Because the Catholic schools in Montreal probably are not doing that. And so, so I'll just finish by giving us a blessing to be able, you know, as Ben Hehe said, "Hafochba, hafochba, de kulaba." Delve into the Torah because it's all there, and and may may may, may Hashem help us to to really go deep in our teachings and to find a, a sustainable path for for us and for future generations. Thank you. I just want to say one thing before, I just, I just found out when I looked at Shemitah, there's an American, American Shemitah. I never even knew about the concept. Many, many non-Jews in America are actually observing Shemitah every mm -hmm. seven years. And they use obviously the sources in, in the volume and so on. I don't know if you, I'm not sure you're aware, aware of it, but it's fascinating. I never thought about it, but I found out this year, by the way. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. It was fascinating. I'm sure we all uh, learn uh, a lot. Uh, I will share the recording of this uh, session and the presentation. And I hope that uh, all of us will, uh, will keep the light and will bring it uh, to our uh, student and uh, community. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.